um, just wanted to give you a quick reminder of where we are since this is our last time together for a moment. Uh, I wanted to remind you about why we chose the name Windfall for this series. We chose this because of that original definition that we talked about where in the original starting of this word, people started using it as an exceptional gain of fruit and lumber that was blown from the trees from a surprising storm. And today it's an exceptional gain from a surprising source. And this is the third installment of encouraging you to become a surprising source of gain for your customers, for your firm, and especially for your own career. And, and by doing that, by going a little bit outside of the bullets on your job description, you will gain a tremendous sense of well-being and fulfillment because of the focus and, and the variety that you gain if you do, do it just a bit. And so, as she mentioned, we've been focused uh, for 30 years on, on helping individuals, teams, and firms achieve exceptional results. We speak about it. We do workshops for teams. And we even have done individual coaching. And so in this series, we have talked about the first thing that needs to happen when we go into a firm, and that is to help teams make quick wins of urgencies, those opportunities that have to be taken care of today or issues that have to be taken care of today. We can point a, a rapid innovation process at that and help them achieve quick wins. And that comes even before strategy. It's a little hard to talk about strategy when there are client urgencies and process urgencies that need our attention the next five minutes. And so we start with the quick wins with this process. And then once we get those teams some quick wins on the urgencies, then it is time to talk about strategy. Unlike most strategy sessions that have to have the executives and, and, and not many more people involved, this is for teams. This is for middle managers to re really be part of the strategy and for everyone to gain a clarity and a path to achieving it. And then we're going to talk today about how getting more involved in the top line and the revenue growth of a company, even just a little bit, can bring a tremendous sense of wellness and, and well-being in the workplace because it delivers such a purpose. It's, it's interacting with things that actually impact those that the company is trying to serve. And so there is a feeling of fulfillment by doing that. And we have studied hundreds. Uh, I, my count is up to 500 sales or revenue responsible people out in the workforce that have achieved around 31% growth versus the status quo that I've spoken to about 500 who achieve around 5% or GDP type growth in their area or responsibility. And we have captured the practices and some of the things that are going on in those quarters. And you see on this slide, the circle, it points to if this is an individual's contribution and it has an effect on revenue, they may have spent a lot of time in that status quo. And, and when they decide to do some of these things, even the same person can achieve exceptional results. And so, sorry, the slide's moving, sticking again. Um, and so today we're going to take you through a process and set of ideas that we call growth point. And it is not just for people that are on the front line or they're directly involved with the sales process or even marketing. It's for everybody in a cube in an office and even a suite within the firm to contribute. It's a very important thing for the firm and it's a very important thing for the individual. So I wanted to start out with a story about my first job. It just shows the difference between a few individuals, even including myself. And I was, I was only 14 or 15 at the time. I wasn't even 16 and I got a job at Dan's Foods and Dan's Foods had a boss, his name, we'll call him Mr. Black, and he had a, uh, another boss over the, not the store, but just the cash registers and the, the checkout, and we'll call her name Shawnee. And then I was there, obviously, and a, a co-worker that had been there quite some time, we'll call Dave, was on the floor. And my first week, I went through training with Dave and Mr. Black, and even they borrowed from the other departments some ideas from Shawnee, and I, I got to the first Saturday. 
And most of us realize that on Saturday morning, it is prime time in, in a grocery store. And they had two work ethics, two rules for baggers in that store. One is when they call this check stand number, you immediately beeline to the check stand and started bagging. The second rule was that you never ask someone if they need help out with their groceries. You always take the groceries out without asking. And it differentiated this store from the others. And so one day I, I, on my first primetime Saturday, I was called to check stand two and I went there and I happened to know, we'll call her Mrs. Skeen because I knew her daughter in my class. And I said hello and bagged her groceries and we started to finish up and I noticed that there were some Pepsi bottles, the old glass eight pack Pepsi bottles. And so I put them under the 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 cart and we rolled out to the the dry the parking lot now as we hit the parking lot it was an unusual little hill and it had a lip and so when i hit that following mrs skeen the pepsi bottles that had been stacked by me horizontally instead of vertically spilled all over the parking lot rolled down the parking lot and started to burst like a firework it was just the most embarrassing thing in front of traffic, Mrs. Skeen. I apologized profusely. I ran back inside, and Mr. Black said, don't worry, but don't do that anymore. You've got you to pack them correctly. And then Shawnee gave me a little bit of a lecture and a lesson that wasn't very comfortable for me as a rookie. And then finally, Dave Croft, my coworker, who was my age, said, don't worry. You'll you'll." You won't ever have that happen again. You'll figure this out. So the next Saturday came and, and I was doing better and a check stand opened up and I went there. And it was Mrs. Skeen again. I got a little anxious, as you can imagine, packed her groceries and tried to race behind her as she was obviously in a hurry and heading out to the parking lot. And as I was following her as briskly as I could, she stopped at the door for a rental magazine in between the two doors and the front of the cart plowed right into her Achilles tendon and it was just horrible and she fell on the ground and everyone noticed and she yelled and I patted her on the shoulder not knowing what else to do and somehow we made it through that together. But then I got a pretty stern instruction from Mr. Black and I also had Shawnee give me a lesson that wasn't very comfortable. And then I had Dave come over to me to clean up the mess. Not that mess, but my mental mess. And he said, don't worry, you won't ever do that again. You're doing a great job here. I've noticed how you work with the customers. Just get back to work, keep going. I promise you'll be all right. So you guessed it. The third week came, I heard check stand four, and there's Mrs. Skeen. And I avoided it. I'm just going to admit it. And I went the other way and I heard over the, the intercom, Mark, go to check stand four, please. Mark, check stand four. So I went over. I apologized to her again. She looked anxious too. And we packed the groceries. I was determined not to make a mistake. I was sure we'd make it. We went out to her car. I packed the groceries. And all of you have probably packed them in the corner and put something to the side of them that was heavy so they don't roll around. And I made it, no problems. And so I reached up and I threw that hatchback down as hard as I could and I hit the, the, the corner of Mrs. Skeen's head with the corner of the hatchback and she fell right to her knees and screamed and everyone noticed and I didn't know what to do. It was a terrible experience. But the moral of the story, we did get through that. She didn't need stitches, but she even got through it. And when we got, when we both got back in the store, Dave Croft waited for a second. And as she went out to her car, finally, he said, listen, you've had some rough goes, but I want to promise you something. If you just stick with this, I've noticed how you've gotten along so well with the parents. I think you might become the best bagger. You might even get promoted to the camera bar if you just stick this out for one year. And so I did, and I did get promoted to the camera bar and pre-cable, that was pretty exciting for a teenager. Now, the reason I tell you this autobiographical story about my very first job 
is because I want you to think about what the different roles were in the story and what they played. How did the boss, the manager of the store, Mr. Black, behave versus how did Shawnee very similarly behave? And she wasn't my boss. And then I want you to think of Dave, who also wasn't my boss. How did he behave? And which of the three helped me more? It, yeah, it was Dave. And so there's a lesson in that that holds true, especially when it comes to working with other people that are not on your team around the organization. We have a direct impact on other people. Dave was exceptional. He behaved different. He behaved differently. He behaved better than even the grown-up bosses. Think about that for a second, how amazing that is, and what an impact it had on my performance and my career. So the first lesson that we discovered as we were interviewing some of the revenue responsible out in the world that had achieved such high results was that first you have to get rid of some of the, the negativity that happens, some of the things that are getting in the way of performance. And you have to do it gently. You have to do it surgically. You can't do it haphazardly or argumentatively. There are some things in your organization that are getting in the way of sales. And it's our job to be a part of the solution in a gentle, careful way and not continue the problem. If you look, as we've talked about in the last two sessions, around the different 10 purposes, the essential purposes of any organization. Obviously, the body of any organization are the people in various forms. Nothing happens without great people. And then after we get great people on board, the, the DNA of any organization is to be careful about the purpose, to make sure we execute for customers and clients and human beings the purpose of what our organization is all about. But there are between one and a hundred teams that accomplish the various tasks that we're staring at right now within an organization. Some are doing accounting, some are doing support, some are managing assets and even maintaining premises. There are so many teams involved in, in a, a medium, medium to even a large size business and many things can get in the way of revenue without us even realizing it. What's some of the expert sales groups and support groups and even the teams around them that are cross-functional have that the non-exceptional teams don't is that they have a particular focus on growing the business in the various ways and those that are that really seem like some of the most competent professionals that I interacted with that are both salespeople and non-salespeople the non-salespeople seem to understand that bringing in revenue is one of the top chronological activities that happens in any business. And if they can get their job description with all the bullets executed well, then they can spend a little time as well focused mentally and even in activity trying to help salespeople, support people, marketing people, whoever's involved with customer interaction to grow the business. So let's talk about this a little bit. Just one quick example I won't go into too deeply is that recently I was with a, an organization and there were two parties involved, the legal department and the entire sales force that was comprised of over five or six teams. And sometimes as they were trying to close business, most of the time it went smoothly. But about a third of the time, there was a, a difficult contracting process. And what had happened is a, a product team had decided to build a simplified form instead of the many, many page contract that in straightforward cases could be used. And they were excited about it. And so they put it in a location on the internet site that was all about their product and, and not available to other parts of the internet. And so salespeople, as I started interacting with this firm, they didn't even realize that this form existed. So they were spent time looking and arguing, and their legal people thought that their deals were complicated, and so they were just going through the normal process, only by bringing them together. And 
being a, a, a middle party and encouraging the legal team to consider things from the prospects and the salesperson's point of view. Did they realize that the, the process needed to be changed, the location broadened, and their perspective needed to be more sales oriented? And they were able to free up tr a, a tremendous number of sales because of that. The next thing we've noticed is that Successful teams in driving revenue, cross-functional teams especially, do something that I call play your depth chart. And they don't stick with the normal team. Let me, let me give you an expla explanation of how powerful this can be. Many of you have probably done the marshmallow challenge. And I don't even do this in my own workshops, but I would, it's, it's a fun little exercise that I would encourage you to do with your own team. You don't need to pay someone like me to do this particular exercise. Um, I usually focus on the work-related exercises, but this is a, an exercise where you just bring your teams together, many different teams, and you break them up in under four people, and you instruct them for the next 20 minutes, they're going to try to build the tallest tower. And the tallest tower built on the ground as a base with a, a marshmallow on top wins. And some of the questions I ask them to pay attention to before they start is to think about their own performance and how it contributes to what happens in their experience. The second thing I ask them to consider is how the other people are working and how they are working in relation to the other people. So performance and people are their focus while they try to win. And it's an interesting thing what happens. Let me give you a couple of uh, statistics about what happens in this um, this type of an exercise. The average for all groups that, that someone has measured, measured and even built, there's been a couple of TED Talks built around this, is about 20 inches. And then you have the people separated by business people and others. And business people are so intense and so focused on what their ideas are that they achieve almost half the average. What's interesting is even lawyers that are so bright and technical barely do better. Maybe the most fascinating thing is that kids beat everybody. They just think we're having fun. They think we enjoy this. They think we're supposed to work and play together. And if they're of, of a, enough age that they can cooperate and speak and not fight all the time, they outperform everyone. Another couple of groups that are interesting is obviously those that have a specialty are terrific at this. They're like, in this case, a salesperson to creating revenue. So we expect that out of them. But what we don't expect is for a CEO to do slightly above average. We would expect them to be right near the top because they are at the top. What is interesting, however, is if you put that administrative assistant, it's maybe worked with them for years in cooperation, and they beat everyone but the specialists because they're so used to working together. And so as you look at these results, you, you see how important collaboration is. Now, intent is important, too. As you're paying attention to whether your ideas are the most important, your collaboration with others, that's important. But also, when, it is, when this exercise is positioned as, hey, we have a problem, and this is going to affect you, if, so we're going to test you on, on your ability to solve problems and look like you as a team to do this exercise. This is the result, about half, a little less than half do average, and many, most of the, the teams don't perform average. What's even worse is if you say, hey, we'll pay you to win, and they're focused so intensely on a, a reward that they lose track of cooperation and, and enjoyable work together. So the people that perform the best in this exercise build something like you see here. And they focus on their own performance and how they interact and cooperate within that network of small team members of four. And they focus on the people as well. It's the poor performance and the team and how they work together that gets the best results. These are the people that achieve a growth point. And so, when you decide as an average employee in a, a, a cube or an office to focus on revenue, it can be a daunting thought. How in the world would you ever do that? It's not your job. 
And I would encourage you to start out with the mindset that you will engage in business development. And the place to start is, is, is some of those other things. But as you decide to take action, just take the perspective of the people outside your company as much as possible. Business development should be about their business. It shouldn't be about ours all the time. This is how you can contribute best. And so we're going to talk just quickly to, to end this about the psychology, what happens over on that other side of the fence, in that other building that we're trying to help. Usually people don't run to us to, to start giving us money. There are actually a lot of internal employees that think the revenue happens quite easily and automatically. And as soon as they spend a week in the field with a salesperson, they are shocked to discover how difficult it is for the company to earn revenue. And so the first step that we need to be sensitive is how difficult it is to even get anyone to listen and start to even want to learn about what we provide or our version of it. And so we have to attract learning. And we can contribute to this in a myriad ways. And we won't go into all the details here, but there are ways that if you go to your marketing department and say, I want to be the star of the blog this week, you will probably be rejected. They are very careful about what's communicated. And then if you go to a salesperson and say, I'd like to come with you to your final sales meeting, you will also be rejected. But there are subtle and very important ways that you can contribute because that salesperson's job has, has got to be to deliver seven diverse messages that are sending something complementary of a learning to that prospect. And they're likely going to have to do it in seven different ways. It might be through an infographic over email. It might be through contributing something on the side, a comment to a blog that was successful. It might be introducing a client that you work with to a prospect that's having a similar problem. It might even just be to persuade your boss to be more engaged in a particular sale because you've gotten to know a salesperson and they have an important prospect. Now, once the, this prospect gets a lot of ideas from a lot of different sources and a lot of different means, what happens at some point is they begin to understand. And in fact, an epiphany is not something that just comes out of a bright mind or out of a good night's sleep. It's something that comes from a series of messages planted all over the brain. And finally, that last one clicks because we've challenged their assumption about things. And so we have to be better at this. We have to challenge prospects to be better. We have to think in our own work, in our own department, how we could contribute to challenging the salesperson's prospect. Because of the second they have that epiphany, they're going to go online and they're going to look for the different vendors that compete in this space. And we have to be ready to help them. Let me just give you one hint that is a great way to help them. If you work with clients at all or customers or even have even heard someone talk about it, you could encourage learning a story that's very simple about that success story. A current client has what I call a Pixar pitch in front of them, and it becomes a reference story. And if you Google just the word Pixar pitch, you'll find by Dan Pink and others, the, gener the general pattern for how Pixar creates a plot. And it's only seven steps long. And if you create this very simple, childlike story out of a client's success, you'll be able to easily tell that story as you bring it to, into the adult world. It's a very great way to create a reference story in your own mind. And so we do all we can to, to help that, that company see that we're the one and compete for their business. Now, as soon as they've decided on three companies to use, they usually in their mind or in a big, thick, formal document, create a list of what they call requirements. And it's our job to help the salesperson from around the organization affect those requirements, to bring to light a previous client that was insistent on a certain exception that, was, that actually did not serve them very well, or a differentiator that isn't being appreciated by the prospect that we have seen 10 clients benefit from surprisingly and tremendously. It's our job to become a crowdsourcer, to talk about, to talk to our neighbors, our family, our friends, our clients that we work with, 
anyone that has a similar problem. How do you solve that problem? As soon as we hear that and become an expert at as many problems as we can. Now it comes to the end where they select who they're going to go with. And we have to help the salesperson and the prospect make their case inside that organization. We have to be brave enough to network on LinkedIn and other means to build a network of consensus, people telling a broad group of buyers, a buying committee within that other firm, what a great experience that they have had. And then we need to be, we need to be willing to offer a paragraph about our specialty to proposals. One of the hints I'd, I'd uh, add at the end of this presentation is as you get to those final meetings with a prospect and the salesperson's driving it and you feel like you're a hundred worlds away, go and offer your expertise. Know that you'll, you'll be expected to participate only if you're prepared and expert. And if you are ever invited into that finals meeting room, act like you're going on stage and presenting Hamlet. You prepare, you practice, you don't just show up ever. And when they notice how prepared you are, you'll be asked to return again. And the final step in this process is to help those clients grow. Help them grow in the number of products they buy and everything else that they do with you to be more successful. And not just what they buy, but help their organization think strategically about their organization and realize that while that buying group, that team on the other side of the fence in that other building has a lot to do, be sensitive to your salespeople and your support people and realize that they have over 96 selling tasks to try to help those people accomplish the jobs that they're expected to, to do to buy a new solution. It's an ominous task. And that's why they get a little short-tempered sometimes. That's why they're not as full of perspective sometimes. Be patient with them and understand their pers perspective first. Like Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand a salesperson's predicament before you try to be understood about the process that needs to happen. I just want to close with a, a story about grit and, and being brave and doing things that other people don't. No one in your cube row is going to try to help sales, but maybe you could. Walter Payton was the greatest running back of all time, and I got the chance to meet him in Chicago once and spend the afternoon with him. And I, because of traffic and an accident, was three and a half hours late and was sure that he wouldn't be there. We were calling his assistant over our cell phone, and I was sure I'd blown my chance. We got there, and sure enough, he'd gone home. But he'd already been called by his assistant, and he came back after his retirement. No need to serve this young kid that I was. He just came to interview this young he interview with this young professional, and I talked to him. He told me a story that was kind of shocking. I said, "You know, I noticed that mountain behind your desk. What is that?" I knew what it was, of course, because I was his biggest fan. And he said, "Well, that's how I trained. It's it's fully one third of how I I train. I run up that hill. I brought the best, and they get tired." But I decided that that's how, that's how I would become better, doing the most important activities that would achieve success on the field instead of trying to be the best in the weight room, which is about performance. I'm about success, not random performance. And I said, wow. Now, you know, I had a hill like that when I was young and I played football, and, and I, I sometimes would quit when I got sick. How about you? Did you ever not go to the hill when you got sick? And he just looked at me with a blank stare. He didn't even understand the question. And finally he said, of course I went and ran. I never missed. If you want to be the best in the world at something, you don't miss because you're sick. And he was disgusted. <laughs> and that response gave me such a lesson. And, and so we began to talk about the other things he did. And the, le the, the second lesson he taught, besides persistence and courage and doing things that other people didn't, he said no one runs through, through a, a forest of trees to become a better running back, but I do because that's the closest thing to success. I don't go in the weight room. I do things. I push against things at home that are heavier than alignment. I do things that are just like success. 
No one works out like I do. And so the lesson that I came away with is, is do the things that work certainly that you're expected to do on your job description with the bullets that come after it. But go beyond that and find a way to be different. Find a, be, find a way to be persistent. Find a way to get your way into affecting revenue and helping salespeople. Because the real success happens with the clients. It doesn't happen in our cubes and offices. It happens with the clients. And so I've been thrilled to be with you these, these last few sessions. And I want you to become that unexpected storm and engage in business development. And remember that if you have just three, of six, three successes like this, helping business really grow and clients really succeed, you are, more, you are far more likely to be promoted and get future opportunity. And the career trajectory will change in your life if you have three successes like this that people notice and that, that make a real difference. So those are some of the, a few of the insights and part of the structure behind growth point the sales methodology and the broader support methodology of helping salespeople and revenue generators succeed. And I'm Mark Cook, and I'm, I'm the creator of the Windfall series. Finally, before I let you go, I just wanted to let you know, if you happen to be one of the few clients that are in Salt Lake City, I'm doing a local event um, this week and this next month. I'm speaking at the UACPA, and if, if you have a CPA or an accountant in your life, they should go to that because they'll get CPE credit, which is required for their license. And then on, in, on October 11th in Salt Lake City, we're having a general team workshop. In the morning, we're, we're attacking quick wins with innovation. And in the afternoon, we're going to go into strategy that we covered last time and take some of your work and your, your firm's priorities through a great prior, uh, strategy process that's much different and much, much clearer than most that you've ever bumped into. And um, let's see. Oh, I've got the dates backward. My, my lovely wife is pointing out. So uh, September, this Friday is when the UACPA is. And then October, that's right. Yeah. So anyway, October 11th is the workshop. September the 13th is the speech at the UACPA. Um, and so if you have any interest in these, just reach out to me at mark at windfallseries.com or anika at anika at windfallseries.com. And you see our phone numbers there and they'll be on this recording. And thank you. And I hope to hear from you and, and hear how this helped you or how you would like me to improve it for the next audience. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks a million. I hope to get to know all of you. Thank you, Mark, so much for all of the expertise that you shared with us. I particularly enjoyed this, <laughs> this webinar and the information that you shared. Um, again, if any of you want to get in touch with Mark, you're also welcome to reach out to us here at Orion and we can help you connect with him as well. Um, but we're going to go ahead and sign off for today and uh, keep an eye on your account for your points later. And this recording, of course, will be available on your account at myoriant.com. Um, later this afternoon as well. So thanks for joining us and have a great day.